Welcome everybody, this is the first video in a series of five that we will be doing to discuss the SMO Junior 2020. To give a quick overview of what is the SMO and if you have never heard of it before, how is it like? The SMO is the Singapore Math Olympiad and there are three sections of the SMO. The Junior section, the Senior section and the Open section. We will try to do videos for the other two sections pretty soon, um, but we're going to start with the SMO Junior, which is meant for secondary 1 and 2 students in Singapore. This is equivalent to 7th and 8th grade in most other countries. And the senior section would be Sec 3 and 4, which is 9th and 10th grade. The open section is, well, open to everybody, but mostly for junior college students, which would be either 11th or 12th grade. Now each of these consists of two rounds. The first round, which is what we are focusing on in this video, for the SMO junior and senior, has 25 questions, of which 5 of them are multiple choice, and 20 of them are short questions, with a single answer required. Each of these is worth 1 point, and the total time allotted is two and a half hours. For the open section, um, this is similar except that there are no multiple choice questions. As for the second round, this is more challenging and so it requires full working and there are five questions to be solved in three hours for the junior section and four hours for the senior or open section. So only the better performing students in the first round would be selected for the second round. Now in this video, we're not going to look at anything from the second round. We're just going to go through the first five problems, which are the multiple choice ones from the 2020 SMO Junior paper. Let's dive right into question one. In question one, we're given three exponential expressions, two to the 300, three to the 200, and six to the 100. We are supposed to place them in descending order. Most of the time, when you want to arrange exponential expressions and you want to compare them, it makes sense to either make the base the same or to make the exponent the same. In this problem, because all the exponents are multiples of 100, it makes sense to try to make the exponents the same. Now for x, 2 to the power of 300 is 2 cubed then to the power of 100, which is 8 to the power of 100. For y, it is equal to 3 to the power of 200, which is 3 squared to the power of 100, and that is 9 to the power of 100. Finally, z is just equal to 6 to the 100. It is already having the correct exponent. Therefore, if we were to compare them and place them in descending order, this would clearly tell us y is greater than x is greater than z, which is nothing more than option d. Moving ahead to question 2, this is a logic puzzle, and it's actually quite an easy logic puzzle because we have 5 suspects, each of them makes a statement, but at the end of this, we realized that only one of them stole the painting and all five were lying. So this makes it really easy because anyone that is accused didn't do it. So we see that Alfred is accused, so he didn't do it. Boris is accused, so he didn't do it. Same for Dan and Eddie. Now the only person who is not accused is Chucky. So Chucky is not accused. And so that means that he must have been the one that stole the painting. So immediately, we can conclude the correct answer is option C. Now for logic puzzles of this sort, whenever they tell you that all are lying or all are telling the truth, that makes it very simple. If the question said that a few of them are lying, um, let's say two of them or three of them, then that would make the question more complex and we would need to split into multiple cases. For question three, this is another puzzle um, and the information given is based on which side of a balance is heavier than the other. So on the left, 
you have one comparison. On the right, you have another comparison. And then overall, down here, you have a third comparison. So let's look at each of them one by one. For the first one here, we are told that two circles will be heavier than a circle and a triangle. So we can conclude the triangle is lighter than the circle. For the one on the right, similarly we have got a circle and triangle versus a circle and a square. Once again, the triangle is now lighter than the square. To compare the circle and the square, we have to use the third one on top, which is the entire left versus the entire right. On the left, we have three circles and a triangle. On the right, we have two circles, a triangle and a square. So the only difference is that one of the circles has essentially been changed into a square. And that has made the overall weight heavier because the one on the right is heavier. So this third comparison tells us that the circle is lighter than the square. Now putting these together, it tells us very clearly that the triangle is lighter than the circle, which is lighter than the square. So this is option D, which we can mark over here. For question 4, the first two statements are just describing positive factors and what we're asked to do is to look at how many integers from 9 to 50 inclusive have exactly four positive factors. Well, certainly we would not want to list out all of the numbers from 9 to 50 and check their factors and list them out, count them and then count how many integers have exactly four factors. This is extremely slow. Now, for counting the number of factors, there is a very simple method. So let me describe it here first and then we'll apply it to this specific problem. Firstly, what we can do is to obtain the prime factorization. The prime factorization is kind of like splitting up the number into its smallest possible components. And I'm going to write it in the form of just p1 to the a1, p2 to the a2, and so on until pn to the an. And the second step is just to get the answer. The answer for how many factors there are is to take the first exponent plus 1 times the second exponent plus 1 all the way until the last exponent plus 1. Now if you're wondering what's the reason for this being the number of factors, there is an explanation involving a combinatorial argument. Um, I can quickly explain it here, but um, you can just think about it slowly as to why this is the case. So the reason is that all the factors would be in the same form except with different exponents. So the factors would look like p1 to the power of something, p2 to the power of something, all the way to pn to the power of something. And these question marks are all constrained by whatever power was in the prime factorization. So, in the prime factorization, if you have a1, it means that 0 to a1 is the range of choices you have. Similarly, for p2, 0 to a2 is the range of choices you have, and so on until for pn, 0 to an is the list of choices that you have. So in total, there are a1 plus 1 choices for p1, a2 plus 1 choices for the power on p2 and so on. So multiplying them together gives you the number of factors. 
I'll encourage you to understand why this method works. However, it is also true that we can just use the method as a black box to solve the question for the time being. So I'm going to just use the method right now, even though you can continue to think about why this is correct. Now for example, um, to show how the method works on our two numbers, 6 is 2 times 3, which is 2 to the 1 times 3 to the 1. So that would be 2 times 2, which is 4 factors. If we look at 8, 8 is 2 to the power of 3. So 3 plus 1 is just 4 factors as well. In fact, these two examples are kind of a helpful hint because it tells us what sort of prime factorizations have 4 factors, which are namely a prime times another prime, such as in the example of 6, or another single prime cubed such as in the example of 8. Now these are the only two ways to get 4 factors. Where PQ obviously are primes. So if we want to know how many there are, unfortunately we do have to list out some of the smaller primes, but Bear in mind that is p times q that has to fit from 9 to 50, so this is more limited than one might mean initially imagine. So listing out the primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, 11, 13, 17, 19, and 23, we can happily stop here because the next prime number is going to be more than 25, and if you multiply that to 2, it would go past 50, so it cannot be of any use to us to list further. And so that means that we can just straight away look at these prime numbers and list out what are the relevant pq and p cubed that have four factors. So 2 times 5, 2 times 7, 2 times 11, 2 times 13, 2 times 17, 2 times 19, 2 times 23. Those are all those multiplied by 2, 3 times 5, 3 times 7, 3 times 11, 3 times 13, and 5 times 7. This actually is the entire list of PQ, but we still have one more, which is 3 cubed that would also work. So let's count 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And so that means that there are 13 such integers which is option D. Now certainly this may have taken a bit of time, but if you were already familiar with the method on the left, then what we did on the right would maybe take you a couple of minutes, which is way faster than listing everything from 9 to 50 and checking how many factors they have. Finally, let's look at question 5. This is another brain teaser of sorts. A company is selling a bottle of juice at $1 per bottle, and every time when you have four empty bottles, you can trade it in for a new free bottle of juice. Now remember that once you have that new free bottle of juice, you could drink it again and then get some more empty bottles and trade it in, but obviously your bottles will eventually run out since you need to trade four to get one new bottle. So let's just note down how this would go if you just drink the bottles of juice and then you trade it in, then you drink and you trade it in until you have no more bottles to trade. So at first, you have 43 bottles and after you trade all of them, you get 43 old bottles. I'm going to note down that you have plus 43 because that is the amount that we have uh, consumed so far. Now after 43 old, we can trade this in and we can trade in 10 sets of 4 to get 10 new and 3 old will still be there. Now don't throw out these 3 old bottles because we could still combine them later on to get another trade. 
Now this 10 new and 3 old, you can drink the 10 bottles and you would now have 13 old bottles. These 13 old bottles, you can trade in 3 sets of 4 to get 3 new and well, one old bottle is left over and we can drink these 3 again. to give us four old bottles. Finally, these four old bottles gives us one new bottle and we can drink that as well. And we are left with one old bottle which is just sitting down there and the company has no interest in it anymore. So looking at the values which have shown up, we have got 43, we have got 10, we've got plus three and then another one more. So in total, this is equals to 57, which is option E. So that brings us to the end of this multiple choice section. In the next video, we'll be looking at questions 6 to 10 of the same paper.